I am really honored to be with you. Um, do you know when you feel like you're half step from being unemployed and you were just barely a student, I want you to know there is no difference between us, very, very little difference between us at all. Um, I have a, uh, and, and, and I want this to be loose, so if there are things that you want to talk about, please raise your hand and redirect me, okay? If this, uh, I don't want this to be a, a lecture, I'd like it to be more of a discussion between friends. And, um, and I really want you to know how much I admire you. Um, each one of you is here um, uh, and sacrificing other things to be here and get in getting an education. You've given up some things and it's hard work. Um, being in business is hard work too, but it's nice to be paid. And right now you're, you're going through a lot of hard work and you're not being paid. And then when you get done, you, you, you get, at least you get paid for it and you don't have finals. So you have a lot to look forward to, I promise. Um, I did want to, um, Mark mentioned something about um, nonprofits. Um, one of the, and, and, and I wasn't going to mention this, but it just, it struck me that one of the nonprofits that, uh, that we're focused on as a company, and my wife and I am, uh, are, have, have had these feelings, and we've kind of, ex we've expressed this to uh, our executive committee. Uh, two or three other executives on our committee were, were also thinking the same thing, but there's a group by the name of Operation Underground Railroad. Anybody heard of them before? Okay. They combined and merged with the Elizabeth Smart Foundation, and they are, they're doing a tremendous work um, rescuing uh, children from uh, sex slaves. And it's a global operation. About uh, once a week or so, I get a text from them that another, op another successful operation has been accomplished. And it'll say, you know, seven children rescued and uh, two people apprehended in uh, Mumbai, or you know, it'll, it, it could be Philadelphia or wherever. It just, it's, it's a global operation. One of the reasons that you're in business and that uh, we, we're all in business is to do some good. And so as you, uh, you chart your course and you think about who you are and uh, what you can accomplish you know, with tremendous ideas and great creativity, the best ideas in the whole campus. That's the kind of thing that we need. And then with that, and with that innovation and with that influence that you'll gain, what good can you do? And uh, as we, we think about that together, um, uh, there's a whole lot of good that the world needs. And uh, w one of the great things about UVU and the tradition here is that uh, UVU students go forward and, and do tremendous good in the community where they live and throughout the world. So um, I'm very proud of my connection with UVU. Um, uh, just meeting Amanda and, and Mark today, I mean, these are, these are great people. Um, the guy sitting in between them, he's not too bad either, uh, Tom <laughs> McDonald. But uh, I've known Tom for uh, probably 25, 30 years. And um, I really appreciate his leadership, his mentoring toward me and as he mentors you, and I know you're getting great mentoring uh, also uh, from Mark and, and many, many others here. Um, oh, let's see. I don't think that's supposed to happen. I need to remove that. Okay. Um, so my brother Jacob is uh, the Associate Dean of the business program, and uh, so we've got Wolverine blood running through our extended family. We love that. Um, uh, I will also tell you that uh, during my undergrad, my undergrad was Near Eastern Studies with an emphasis in ancient history and ancient Hebrew. So no matter what you're studying, uh, life might take you a different direction, and uh, not all of you are gonna end up in business, and that's great. But it's great to study it, and it's a fantastic discipline, uh, much more useful generally than uh, studying a, uh, a dead language and people that lived on the earth a few thousand years ago. I can tell you that for, for sure. Uh, when I uh, figured out that I needed to get a job, I, I went and I got my MBA. And uh, that was, uh, locally, that was the only option uh, at the time. And uh, had a great experience at BYU. 
During, uh, however, during my studies in the Near East um, and at the BYU Jerusalem Center, one of my, um, uh, uh, one of our uh, dorm mates was uh, Matt Holland, the young Matt Holland. So uh, I connected with him many years ago, and we've stayed friends since then. Uh, he married a high school friend of ours, so we've, we've had a, a fantastic relationship with, with your great president, and I have the utmost respect for him and everybody here at UVU. It's a, uh, it's a very, very classy, and you should know throughout the community, people love UVU. It is a community uh, institution, a lot of people obviously have donated to, to, to keep the program moving, but uh, I, I got involved uh, during the administration of Bill Cedarberg, and uh, a tremendous change took place then, and, and the university continues to roll forward under President Holland's leadership, so a uh, wonderful association. Now times are changing, and uh, you're going to need to, um, you're gonna need to make a lot of um, decisions as you go forward. Um, one of these decisions uh, that I saw a, a good man make uh, recently in this obituary was he said, uh, in lieu of flowers, please don't vote for Hillary. This, these are interesting times, right, with a great, uh, a great upheaval in, uh, uh, in our society and in business. And, there's, uh, and, and by the way, I feel the same way about almost all the candidates running. So whether you choose don't vote for Hillary, don't vote for Trump. I don't know who we're going to vote for, but anyway, um, interesting times these days. Um, and yet, when you go into business, um, many of you will, uh, will select some aspect of entrepreneurship. I'm going to roll through these slides fairly quickly so that we can just talk and I can tell you some stories. I've got some successes, and I think a couple of people wanted to hear about some failures when I've really lost it and I want to tell you about those two. So entrepreneurship, when you look at the definitions of entrepreneurship, there is one word in common uh, with all the classic definitions, and it is what? It is risk. So entrepreneurs take risks, and that's what has made, it's one of the aspects that has made America great. American business is about risk taking, and we reward risk takers sometimes. And actually, maybe, maybe what, one out of 10? We really reward them. And the rest of them, we don't. They are failures. But that's OK, because look at what Winston Churchill said. Success is stumbling from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. So that's just part of the game. Uh, you, you, and, and also part of the game is minimizing those risks and understanding them and then uh, risk taking becomes a lot more tolerable. So um, I want to talk just briefly about approaches to markets and innovation and the different kinds of risks. I'm not going to go through these in great detail, but um, uh, basically when it comes to entrepreneurship and risk taking, there's, um, there's a red ocean approach and the blue ocean approach. And the red ocean approach is uh, risk taking within more established markets. Okay, and, uh, and frankly, that's more of what I'm doing today in the hospitality industry. It's an existing market. There are established patterns uh, to it. Um, there, it is a fierce competition. And, um, and you can easily, because of the amount of competitors, you can easily lose customers um, you know, uh, out of your business, or you can gain them uh, with, with little tweaks. As opposed to blue ocean, the approach, new uncontested markets. These are the real pioneers. And uh, a lot of these companies are very famous and have caused a tremendous shift in our society. Um, it can be rather exotic. I've tried that one, that kind too. And I can tell you, uh, there are pros and cons to both, and you can really end up having a fun time with a whole lot of arrows in your back in the blue ocean area. Now, one of the, um, you can read through these definitions as I'm going to go forward kind of quickly here, but um, um, here's a couple of examples. When you, you th you'd think that there's no more innovation to do in something as common as food. 
But there actually is, when you think about the evolution of food, there really is a lot of innovation that you can still, that you can still do and you can still have great ideas in something as common as food and water. But just look at food for a second. Fresh produce. Vegetables led to canned, then to frozen, and then recent years, GMO, now non-GMO, and now there's organic, right? And prepackaged. All of these innovations are being driven by uh, consumer behavior and, in fact, mar marketeers are telling people what they should be eating. And it's driving, you think about everything from the grocery store and what you're eating, but all the way back to the farm and production. And it's all being driven by, by innovation. Here's another great example. Water, same thing. Do you know that it costs, even when gas was $4 a gallon, which I would like to see it go back there because I'm going to tell you why in a couple of minutes. But even when gas was $4 a gallon, we were still paying more for water. Water. Somebody told us that we had to buy it bottled and then we had to have certain types. You know, you could just have spring water, but then you had to have it uh, distilled and then you had to have pH balanced water and all kinds of stuff. I mean, they're innovating water. So you can innovate in a tremendous number of areas, okay? And you, you can be an entrepreneur with, in a whole lot of fields. Let me just tell you a couple of experiences and uh, I'll give you some background um, with uh, a couple of family companies and things that I've done. Um, uh, Mark mentioned Dynex and I'm going to go back to 1983. Um, in fact, uh, Tom McDonald, um, uh, Tom McDonald, how long were you at Dynex? Okay, five or six years. Uh, great years, they were. Um, Dynex, Dynex was, and I don't know that it is anymore, uh, and now it's called Circe Dynex, and it's, at the, uh, it's in Lehigh. But um, uh, the company that started Circe Dynex was, uh, was Dynex, and it was started in Edgemont, and it was in our family home, 1983. My father and uh, three partners, um, uh, left a, another firm to start library automation back in the days when card catalogs were the thing. And I remember those days. I used to walk into even the BYU library in the late 80s and I'd go to the card catalog. That's how we used to find books. Now, you don't, most of you won't remember that. But you can imagine a, an enormous technological shift away from paper documents and card catalogs to something electronic and digital. And Dynex, um, in, Dynex managed that and managed the inventory and also the customers of libraries. Inventory meaning books and the customers were the patrons. And it had systems to be able to do that. But it started in the basement. I remember my mother saying, Joel, you might need to quit your piano lessons. I was 14 years old you might need to quit your piano lessons because your father is out of a job and they're starting something new, but we're gonna be really tight on money. And I thought, this is great. No <laughs> piano lessons, this is a great gig for me. So that's, um, and, and uh, what they were doing is, my dad was out selling a system that hadn't been created and his partners rented a computer for a few days between the semesters at BYU, a computer that wasn't being used because they didn't have one and they needed to code. And then they went to Pleasant Grove, and, they, uh, and for several weeks uh, that turned into months, they borrowed a computer for an, from another company up there, and they would go in at 7 or 8 p.m. and code through the night because that, th that group of individuals had left and gone home, and they weren't using their computer anymore. Computers were scarce. My dad sold Murray Public Library, a system that didn't exist. They bought, they bought the system and they coded it while they were delivering it. And that's how the world's largest library automation system got started. And it was in Provo. Now, whose risk? Yes, it was the founder's risk, but I would say it was also Murray Public Library's risk. 
they went out on a limb and bought a system that had never existed before. Why would they do that? Why in the world would, you, would a customer do something like that? Any ideas? Like what would compel them to do that? Okay, they believed in the value of the product, right? Is that what you said? That's right. Okay, and s th yes. Maybe the customer was willing to risk everything. He didn't like his job. He could either get fired by doing it or he'd get promoted from doing it. Okay, okay, <laughs> yep. And it was, they were willing to do that because they saw certain benefits in the product. I think that's absolutely true. I do think that there's one more thing, especially as it, re as it relates to entrepreneurs, at least that I found to be true. There's one other aspect that's different than the product. They believed in Paul. Okay. They believed in people. There was a group of people, these four guys, five people, six people, and I, and I think Earl Boyce was, was the, the fifth, and then there were others that came. They believed in the people. That um, you, can't, you can't deliver that message without being credible yourself. And to be able to do that, you've got to be, um, you, you do need some experience. Not maybe as much as you'd think, though. But you've got to be honest. You have to have that integrity. You've got to have that transparency that people can trust you. Because you're sticking your neck out to risk, and so are they. Because with, when you're an entrepreneur, it doesn't, it, it, what you're selling has not existed previously. Whether it's blue ocean or, or red ocean, it hasn't existed, and you're tweaking something. So here's another, here's another example. A uh, company that uh, we founded uh, many years ago called uh, Management Dynamics. Uh, we did the similar thing. It was, a, it was software. It was decision support application software, um, also in the library industry. And um, I used my dad's connections and industry expertise, and we hatched an idea to help um, library administrators make better decisions on a number of things, but uh, particularly um, uh, business decisions on, uh, for budgeting and what books to buy and so forth. We found a group of individuals that were very influential but had never been marketed to and they were called state data coordinators. Now that's only something a state government could come up with, a state data coordinator for libraries. But there are 50 states and there were 50 state data coordinators. Simple thing, we showed up at one of their annual meetings and we set up a booth outside and we started paying attention to them and within, uh, within two years, we had 37 state contracts to deliver data that they used to get in published form and we did electronically and they paid us hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in a subscription basis to do it. It was just paying attention to people, being credible and finding a niche. I'm gonna go on. Um, Another example, Dynamic City, this one right here. Dynamic City was the asset manager for a, um, for a technology uh, infrastructure called Utopia. Has anybody heard of Utopia? Okay. I, I won't ask you what it stands for because I can barely remember myself, but it's uh, the Utah um, Open Service Provider infrastructure network or something like that. I, I, I don't remember the full acronym, but it, it was basically fiber between 14 cities and fiber to the home back when that was an absolute, like nobody could think of that uh, being done. We helped to create that. And we visited with a couple of cities and they loved the vision of it here in Utah and they decided that they would form an organization called Utopia, where they were just a consortium of cities, and really start the ball rolling. Getting, breaking into that world is extremely difficult. Um, how do you contact busy mayors, and how do you get their attention, and how do you do it out of state, and how do you grow? 
one of the things we did was we approached state lobbyists in other states and we used them instead of lobbying for on state government we used them for their local connections to mayors and we found a way to penetrate and to break into a market that had previously never been broken into. And the result of it was creating the world's largest publicly owned municipal fiber network, of fiber to the home network. And it does exist actually here, uh, Orem is, is part of that, uh, part of that effort. So the innovation, and that by the way was a blue ocean. Um, that was a, a very radical thing, especially at, at, at the time. Uh, but the innovation and the way that you penetrate and, the, and the, the, the way that you do it with integrity is extremely important. Now, I want to I focus more on the hospitality. Anybody in this room uh, interested? I, how many are business management majors? Okay, most. And then of that, um, is there anybody interested in hospitality in particular? Okay, great, a handful. Um, I want to focus a little bit on hospitality because that's what I'm doing right now. Um, I spend more, more time on that than anything, anything else. Um, I've come into a Red Ocean. Um, I came into a Red Ocean uh, group, uh, Red Ocean Industry. Um, not particularly innovative, but hospitality, uh, the company that we have, Lodging Dynamics, is uh, we, we operate 20 hotels in about eight states. Um, as far east as Illinois and as far west as Hawaii. We have a very diverse set of hotels. Um, Marriott, Hilton, Hyatt, and Holiday Inn are the brands that we focused on. When I started, I came in in 2008 and I became the president in 2009. I know this is going back a few years, but anybody remember what happened in 2009? Yeah, it was a, a, a global collapse of um, economies, and particularly it was bad in real estate, wasn't it? So that would seem like absolutely the worst time to go into a real estate-oriented business. And in, indeed, it was hard. Not necessarily the worst time, but it was really hard. Mm -hmm. We had at the time, when I started, three hotels under management. We had two hotels in, in, uh, in Salt Lake and one in Provo. And um, what we didn't know at the time was um, those hotels were drained of cash and they were leveraged higher than they should have been. So we had more debt on them. That means our mortgage, we're just paying more mortgage than we should have been paying. And um, when I spoke to the owners about the situation after I'd been in for a couple of months and I could see what was happening, they said, oh, don't worry. We, we've been through recessions before. I'm sure it won't be that bad. Well, the recession they'd been through before was, um, uh, was during the Olympics. And it was right after 9-11, and, and the, all of the United States, in fact, much of the world had shut down, except for this pocket in Salt Lake City because of the 2002 Olympics. Well, that's where we had our hotels. We had not experienced a recession before. Everyone else had, but our hotels in, in, in Provo and Salt Lake City were protected by the Olympics. We hadn't, we hadn't any idea what a real recession could do. And so we got started. One of the first things we did was we, we tried to look at um, everything objectively and discover all the bad news and start talking about it. And my, I remember, I, I thought, boy, this is gonna be fun. Here we thought we could articulate a building strategy and we are, in, um, we are in defense mode and we've got to protect our turf and at the same time try to grow through this recession. We gathered data, we started letting everybody know, hey, this hotel's underwater and we're gonna to have to bring in some more capital. We moved very quickly because what we didn't know um, and what we were concerned about is if we didn't call for capital for the hotels that we were managing, those same investors would be called for their capital in other businesses. And so we moved fast and we started uh, recapitalizing a, a couple of the hotels. We also started seeking new investment. And believe it or not, even in those years, we found some. 
I started looking for other ways to grow the company. My sister hatched an idea. She used to live in San Francisco and she'd come visit in, in uh, Salt Lake and Provo. And she said, you know, between Reno and Salt Lake City, there's not a Marriott. Why don't you build one at the halfway point in Elko? That's where we would have liked to have stopped. Based on her comment, I went out to Elko, a place that I'd been only a couple of times before passing through, found some land, and then simultaneous to that, I found a very wealthy guy who had an inkling, he had a desire to put some money. He just sold a huge company and made about a quarter of a billion dollars. And he wanted to get into hotels. I, didn't, I heard his name, I didn't know who he was. I was having breakfast with um, uh, my then brother-in-law at a little place in American Fork, and my brother-in-law He's, he was kind of a shyster, but he knew, he knew all the rich people. And he pointed across the room, he said, hey, there's that guy. Well, it was exactly the guy that I'd wanted to talk to. I just didn't know what he looked like. I got rid of my brother-in-law, walked over to this table and introduced myself. And he said, come visit with me. They ended up being the major backer to our hotel effort in Elko. And we started to grow. It did, by the way, take us a year and a half to get a loan even with a huge backing from a very, very rich, uh, a very, very wealthy family. It took us a year and a half to get a loan because banks had just shut down. But somehow we survived. And I think it was the best thing for our executive team to have gone through that because um, we were new. We had been proven in other fields, some of us. A couple of, the, a couple of my colleagues were hospitality experts, but they'd never been above property managing a management company. And so our education was, in fact, during the recession. And we were, that was a great, great way to get started uh, in the business because you never forget those lessons. Now, fast forward a number of years. We're now developing hotels in Moab. Uh, I fly uh, this afternoon to um, uh, San Jose. We've got a site um, in Milpitas, which is right by San Jose. We're a block away from Cisco on that property. That property will cost three and a half acres. It's going to cost us $7 million to buy. Just the property. Upon which we'll have the privilege of building, you know, 220 room um, Marriott Hilton type hotel. That'll cost us, you know, 45, 50 million to do. And when I say us, by the way, this is the OPM model, right? Other people's money. So we'll, we'll put in what we can, but most of what we're doing is raising money from, from private investors. And they have to believe me, and I have to be credible enough to be able to get that money to come in. Tonight, I will, I'm staying in a hotel in Napa. We've got our eye in a, on a site in Napa, Napa Valley. And then we have two, almost three sites in Hawaii. And we've picked the markets that are the most profitable hotel markets in the Western United States. And we focused on brands that we think that um, attract the kind of guests that we understand and also have a high trade value. And that's what, that's what we're into right now. Now let me back up a second. A couple of our recent successes. Um, in fact, this, um, Oh, one of the hotels that was on the, on the board, we, we, uh, and I'll talk about that. Sec one of you will win a, a free night stay at our little Fairfield in, in Moab. Okay, and there's a couple of blackout dates where you can't go, but, um, and I'll tell you why, because that hotel last year, um, it, we went to the legal limit of how much we could charge for a room. I'm very proud of this because we've never had a hotel that hit the legal limit before. But on Memorial Weekend last year, we sold a few rooms for $449. Anybody ever stayed in a Fairfield? Is it, it, would you pay $449? That's the right answer. She's, a, she's very smart. No, I would not. I wouldn't pay, I wouldn't pay $449. I wouldn't pay $249 for a Fairfield. But the going rate was, you know, and it started off in the high 200s, then in the 300s, and as, as our rooms became more scarce, we, we upped the price. 
right? You want to you want to maximize your profits. It costs us the same to clean that room as it does a room that we sell for 220. So if you could sell that same room for 449, well, there was a there was a, there were two more desperate guests. Later that night, we had two rooms left, 499. We sold two rooms for 499. So what does that tell you? Build another hotel in Moab. That season's about nine or 10 months long. It's a great season and that's a great place to be. So we're doing another hotel. We'll break, we've already broken ground. We're gonna, uh, we'll start going vertical construction at the end of April with a, a Marriott uh, Spring Hill Suites. Okay, now, um, last year, and whether I was the developer of this or not, just you can blame me for it because I actually hatched the idea, I started it. I wasn't the developer, but I did, I did start this idea. Just a few months ago, we opened a hotel that should have been doing that, but isn't. And it's in Dickinson, North Dakota. Does anybody know where Dickinson is? Anybody been in North Dakota? Are you serious? Okay, okay, there's a couple of people who've been to North Dakota. My wife wanted to go to all 50 states, and uh, we had to really try to go to North Dakota. We were in South Dakota, and on a Sunday afternoon after church, we drove up over the border of North Dakota. We drove in for about, about 15 minutes. She said, why are you still driving? I said, I want to make sure we're all the way in because I don't want to come back here. <laughs> we got all the way in, and then, um, and then we turned around and left, and the whole family had been to North Dakota. We could check it off the list. I didn't know I'd be going back to North Dakota later. But I did. I went back on business. And at the time, there were four of us traveling together. Um, they shut a bridge down late at night. We couldn't get to our man camp accommodations. That's the only hotel room we could get was we had a connection to a man camp. If that sounds, if you're female and that sounds grotesque, I promise you it is, okay? <laughs> And guys, it's not like a man cave. It's worse than that. But anyway, we couldn't go, but we found in this little town, we found one hotel room, two beds. We all piled, all four of us guys piled in the two beds because that's all we could get. We paid $220 for a, a motel that wasn't worth 69. That's a great place to build a hotel, you'd think. Except, and so we did, except when oil prices drop. So we have a $13 million Marriott in Dickinson, North Dakota, right now. Say that again? That's why you want oil prices to go back up. When I'm paying $4, look, I'd be happy to pay three, because when I'm paying $3 at the pump, we're not dumping cash and monthly capital calls into a hotel in North Dakota. So we have, um, uh, we, are, we are on a, a very short leash on that property. The banker that did the deal is at that property tonight checking it out because he knows that we're gonna be having a conversation with him, well, and he's gonna be having one with us. Now we've got tremendous, we do have backing, but that's not the way you wanna go into an investment. And everybody went in wide-eyed and experienced, okay, this is a red ocean group, and we understand we've been here before, not particularly innovative. But back up a couple of years ago, we had some of the biggest private equity groups in the world knocking on our door saying, send me your numbers on North Dakota, we want in. We're gonna make a lot of money together. And here was the dilemma. I would send them numbers and it would go like this. And I'll just, I'll, have, you ever seen, have you ever seen a projection, a forecast? You know, usually, and Tom taught me this years ago, he taught me the hockey stick model. He said, yeah, when, when you do, do your numbers and you go out um, and how much money you're gonna be making over the years, you wanna go like this, and then hopefully you can justify making it go up like a hockey stick, right? It makes everybody feel good. Well, I sent them numbers like this because I said, look guys, we're making a lot of money, but we think in the future there's gonna be a risk that oil prices are gonna come down. Well, nobody wanted that. Nobody believed me. 
And so I said, okay, we'll send you a different set of numbers. We know the market's up here, but we're gonna start here and then maybe we could justify doing a hockey stick because we started so low that we're gonna surprise everybody and, and we're gonna sandbag a little bit and we'll make money that way. Well, they didn't believe that either. We had a hard time selling equity because they couldn't decide how they wanted to see the model because the markets were that crazy, that extreme. Well, that should have told me something. Maybe you don't go into a place like that at all. I think that after this year, we're gonna do just great. But I don't know how long it's gonna take for oil prices to bounce back. But we've got a long year ahead of us. A long year ahead of us. Right now, we're calculating what our real operational and debt break even is. We think it's about 45 or 50% occupancy at our current rate, but we're trying to calculate that. We started the first month with 5% occupancy in the hotel because we had to fire our salesperson because she made a tremendous mistake um, right two weeks before we opened the hotel. So that was disaster upon disaster. We got a new salesperson and she's doing great. We're last week, last three weeks, we've been about 15% occupancy average. She just landed a big group that's gonna double that. We're gonna go to 30. I've never been so excited to be at 30% occupancy at a hotel in my life. <laughs> but we think we need another couple of big groups and we have to steal them from other hotels to survive. And we have to innovate and we have to make them feel good and they have to trust us. Anyway. How do they win? How do they win? You want to tell them how they win. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, who wants a free night? Would anybody be interested in a free night in Moab? Okay. I have five brothers. You may have heard one already. That's a gimme. Name the other four brothers and be the first one to do so. And yeah, you've got a name. You have to guess them right. Okay, now here's, here's, the, here's the, the clue. All, I'm Joel. You heard my brother's name earlier. The other four brothers also start with J. They're J names. Okay, now you have to be the first one to email Amanda. And this is her email address. The first one to email her with the correct six brothers in an email. And you get, to, and we'll send you a, a, a pass from Moab, and you will not pay $4.99. <laughs> unless, unless you stay tuned. Unless you stay tuned. Okay. Now, anybody, uh, there's probably one minute left. Anybody have a question or two? We might have time for one question. Yes, sir. What's, what's the, hotel the one in Elko is the Marriott Town Place Suites. It's the same. Right yes, it's right by Wingers. Good job. That's the, it's almost the same version that we built in Dickinson, North Dakota. So it, it, it actually worked out, that Elko one worked out very well. Are you from Elko? That's a great place. Ruby Vistas are beautiful. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. What was her critical mistake? What's that? Her critical mistake that you talked about. Oh, Just this, this um, our sales gal in Dickinson, um, there was something that wasn't rational in her, and you can't train that. She, um, we're a franchise group, and she worked for our company, and on a Friday afternoon, she got it in her head to email the CEO of Marriott complaining about a lack of marketing resources. There was something wrong about that. There were some other things in her behavior that we'd been noticing some weeks before, and it created a pattern and when she did that, and what happened is Marriott, uh, about five VPs, that email went through about five VPs in about in a few hours. And Friday night, it got to our VP with a note, you need to retrain her. And we felt like uh, with the history that we've been seeing for the previous month, even though we'd had her with us about two months, but we had been worried for about one month, and that was a straw that broke the camel's back. And Marriott didn't tell us what to do but we just knew that that behavior was not, we couldn't trust that she was gonna be able to perform going forward with doing something irrational like that. Yes, sir. How does your business model work, Josh, and what is it? Is it consulting, 
Okay, so we manage hotels. And so we're, we, we, um, we have a capital side where we acquire and we develop hotels. So we take investment money in, we either put it into an acquisition or development, and then once we've done that, we manage the hotel. And the hotel management means that uh, these hotels are empty boxes without the employees and without the maintenance and all that kind of stuff. And it's 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, keeping those brand standards. So we charge for that, but we also charge we, we make a fee, we set up an incentive that if we do a great job on the development or an acquisition, we make money as, our, as or after our investors make money. So there's a couple of different ways that we make money. Great question. Okay, I think uh, we're probably out of time. Thank you for letting me come and be with you.